If you will, turn in your Bibles to the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, beginning in verse 23, as we continue our study through the Word. Now, you'll remember that Saul had been wreaking havoc amongst the church there in Jerusalem. He was going into the houses, taking men and women and arresting them, binding them and having them thrown into prison. And and you will remember that there was now word that that there were Christians uh, in Damascus. And so Saul goes to the chief priests and asks for letters, asks for authority to be able to go to Syria, to Damascus, and to arrest the Christians that are there and bind them and, and bring them back to Jerusalem. And so the letters were issued and granted and Saul heads off on, uh, on his journey. And, and you remember that as he is approaching Damascus, as he gets near, that suddenly he encounters the Shekinah glory of God. He encounters the, uh, the Lord himself. And you remember that the light was so bright that it knocks him right to the ground. And, and you'll remember that, uh, that he hears a voice, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And in his response, who are you, Lord? As he is down on the ground. And, and you remember that the Lord answers, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And it is difficult for you to kick against the goads. And, and in a flash, in a moment, the encounter with Jesus Christ there on the road to Damascus, when, when Saul was so convinced that he is headed in the, the right direction. You see, Saul's life was focused on the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. And he was convinced that Jesus was not the Messiah, that Jesus was a, a false Messiah. And here were all of these people that were starting to chase after this false Messiah and, and they are being led astray. And he's not going to let the children of God, the, the children of Israel, be led astray by, by some scheme of, uh, of man. And so he was in absolute opposition, protecting it now zealously the, the law and all that God had given to them through Moses. And, and suddenly he discovers there on the, the road to Damascus that Jesus is uh, the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. And his whole world is absolutely rocked. Rocked in a good way and rocked in a, in a bad way. In a moment in time, he begins to recognize that the kingdom of God is at hand, that Jesus is the Messiah. And, and suddenly the scriptures and the portrait of Christ, but, but then also in the wake, looking back at the harm that he had done to believers, the, the wounds that he had caused the body of Christ, and, and even his intent in coming to, to Damascus was to arrest more and to bring them back to Jerusalem. And, and the words out of his mouth, what, what should I do? And Jesus says to go into the city and I will tell you what will be next. Saul stands uh, up after having been knocked down by the light to discover that he can't see, that mm, he's been blinded. Those that were accompanying him, it says, had to lead him by the hand into Damascus. And, and so he, he heads to the house of Judas on the road straight. You remember that Ananias was a disciple that was living there in Damascus and and you remember that, that the Lord speaks to him now in, in a vision and, and tells him that, 
that he is to arise and, uh, and go to the street narrow and, and that there is a Saul and you're to lay hands on him and pray for him and he is going to receive his sight that he has already gone before him and told these things to, to Saul and that Saul is waiting now for him. And you remember his apprehension. Lord, this man has a reputation. He's seeking to, to harm all of the Christians. And you remember Jesus' response. He is my chosen vessel. He's my chosen vessel. And I have shown him the things that he must suffer as he now will bring the gospel. He is going to bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And Ananias, you'll remember that reluctant as he was, he is obedient and he comes and lays hands on Saul and <coughs> instantly the scales fall from his eyes. What? would appear to be like scales and and he can see he is baptized and and you remember that that he begins to fellowship now with the disciples and uh, and the believers that are there and and instantly he goes into the the synagogue the Jews that are there, he now knows the truth, the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. He hadn't seen it before. But now he sees it, and in that awakening to the truth, he wants everybody to be awakened to that truth. He had been deceived uh, now, and, and he wants everybody else to wake up and to, and to come forth from the deception that, that they are now underneath. And, and so he begins to, to witness uh, there and to prove, it said, to prove from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. In verse 23, we see the response to those Jews that were there in Damascus. So when Saul is proving to them from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah, in verse 23, it says, And now after many days were passed, the Jews plotted what? To kill him. That was their response now to the truth that Jesus is the Messiah. They wanted to hold on to their life. They wanted to hold on to their beliefs uh, rather than testing it against the mm, truth. And, and so when truth was inconvenient to, to their life and to their belief, uh, then they simply were going to eradicate the truth, just simply silence uh, the, the truth. Free speech is so important. Our nation is founded on the principle of free speech. And, and it is dangerous the minute that we start to remove the freedom to speak truth or to speak non-truth. You see, our nation was founded upon the belief that in the marketplace of ideas, all ideas are welcome to be tested. And, and those that are valuable will rise. And those that are not valuable will be discarded and will be uh, removed. And but when any group begins to remove even the conversation from the marketplace, we now are in danger of moving away from being the collective that now has the power to be able to rule by truth. Here we see that in truth now, will just kill the person who is bringing that truth and that will solve uh, our problem. We won't have to contend. We won't have to wrestle with it. We won't have to struggle with it uh, uh, any longer. Today in our culture, there is an attack upon truth. In fact, when Pilate asks Jesus, what is truth? That is the very thing that's happening in our culture today. It is the eradication that there is any knowable, outside, discernible, moral truth. There is no such thing. It's whatever we decide. And so in the absence of truth, opinion reigns supreme. But opinion or truth... Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except and through me. And that's not an opinion, that's in truth. And, and so we have the word of God. 
which is true. Thy word, thy truth is a light unto my path. It's a, a lamp unto my feet. And, and so here they were being challenged, listen, with an inconvenient truth. And so rather than testing it to see if it's true, to investigate it and to do an honest search, they just simply were going to silence the, the voice of Saul. And so it says, and, but the plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And so here we see that underneath King Aretas, who was the king of Syria at the time, the governor now had put out uh, uh, there in Damascus orders to, to find and arrest uh, Saul. They were guarding the main gate by which you would come in and out of the city. And, uh, and so there is the discovery now that, that they're looking for Saul. And so the disciples take and, uh, and, and they bring him and help him in verse 25. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a large basket. The walls of the city there in Damascus, they oftentimes would build residences uh, uh, up on the higher portions of the wall. And, and so they had a window. No doubt that this was expensive real estate, having a a window on the wall overlooking the, uh, the city and outwards uh, from there. And so Saul is put into a basket at night and lowered out with a rope and all the way down and, and he departs now from the city. He heads to Jerusalem and we see that in Galatians it tells us that uh, that he came to visit the apostles and uh, and we see here that he spends a couple of weeks uh, there and and then he departs he he departs to arabia and he spends 3 years just processing all that he has been through his life's journey his zeal for god a zeal for God that brought him from Tarsus to Jerusalem to study underneath the feet of Gamaliel, the greatest, most renowned rabbi of the time. And he was the most brilliant of their students. He rises uh, extraordinary intellect and capability, becomes a young member of the Sanhedrin. He's given special commission. He has access to the high priest. His is a, a career that is just uh, jettisoned uh, and towards uh, stardom. And, and now he has departed all of that. He understands that Jesus is the Messiah and the very thing that he was working against is, is now the very thing that, that he is loyal to. The scriptures, the portrait, his life's journey. Three years he spends in, in Arabia. And then he comes back to Jerusalem again. It says in verse 26, And so when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. Saul had caused so much havoc there in Jerusalem. It harmed so many homes and marriages and families. And, and when he returns back to the, the scene of the crime, back to Jerusalem itself, and, and he wants to immerse himself now uh, alongside the other believers whom he had persecuted and tormented and, and had arrested, they, there was suspicion. Suspicion that possibly this is this, an elaborate plot that, that now he is infiltrating the church. And, and so the, the, there was a great wariness to Saul. It says, but Barnabas, verse 27, took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And and so he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Barnabas 
welcomes uh, Saul into the family of God with simple friendship. He goes to the other apostles and, uh, and declares to them that this is the one who had been on the road to Damascus and had preached boldly in the synagogues. And, and so they, they welcomed him and, and they opened up the doors for Saul and the fear of the disciples now vanished and, and Saul is free in the coming in and in the going out. But where does he go? Verse 29, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the, the Hellenists. But they attempted to what? <laughs> to kill him. And so now what does he do? Just like Stephen, he goes right into the synagogues. And, and there are the Jews. There are his countrymen. And I want you to know that Saul is so zealous. zealous. He's always been a zealous person. He is the kind of guy that whatever he does, he's doing 250%. That's it. He is an all in on whatever he is doing. When he was wrong, he was all wrong. But when he's right, he is all right uh, uh, as well. And, and, and we see now that his heart for his countrymen. You know, when you've been deceived... Uh, and you find out that you've been deceived, there's a sting to that, there is a hurt, and you don't want anybody else to be tricked or trapped by the same thing that tricked and trapped you. And, and Saul now burns for his countrymen who are waiting for the Messiah and don't know that Jesus is the Messiah. And so he wants to show them, he wants to sit down, he wants to talk to them, he wants to show them from the scriptures, he needs, to, he needs in his heart and in his life to, to set these people free to enter into the, the glorious kingdom of God that Jesus Christ has come and set up. They're waiting for the kingdom of God and Saul recognizes the kingdom of God is here right now. You don't need to be waiting any longer. You can go in and enter into the kingdom. And there's all these people waiting to enter into the kingdom. And the door is open and Christ is that door and you are free to come in. And so he is zealous, he is passionate for his countrymen. And so he shares, he witnesses, he, he proves to them. And, and once again, they are threatened by the truth. And so rather than examining the truth and testing these things to see if they are so or not, they just want to silence the voice. They want to silence the voice. They want to silence the voice. And when his brethren found out, they excuse me, brought him down to Caesarea and they sent him out to Tarsus. Saul. We want to talk to you for a minute. We've been praying and we think that you need to go home. What? I, I, I've been commissioned by the Lord. I, I, he's already shown me the things that he is. I'm his chosen vessel. I'm supposed to bring the, the, the good news. Saul, so, go home. You're creating too much disturbance in here. We've been praying. We think you need to depart. And if you can imagine the, the defeat that he must have felt at that moment, go home. But we see that later on in chapter 22, here in the in the book of Acts, it will tell us uh, how Saul now is praying and, and he heads uh, out and, and the Lord tells him that it's time for him to depart. And, and so Saul heads to Tarsus uh, now. He will spend 10 years back in Tarsus again before the Lord is going to use him. And, and it says in verse 31, then the churches throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Saul leaves, he departs and, 
and it says that, that now the church continues to spread through Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. And, and it's interesting, Judea is the area around Jerusalem. We see the spread there of the church. And you remember how Philip takes the gospel to the Samaritans and there is the explosion there. And it tells us that now it, the churches are growing in Galilee. But I want you to know that nowhere in the book of Acts does it tell us who or what disciples or apostles went to Galilee. Remember the apostles, uh, were, most of them were all from Galilee. They were Galileans, and, and so they go and start planting churches. It's a reminder to us that the book of Acts is not the complete history of the early church, and, uh, and so we do not have a, a, a complete version of all that was going on. Luke summarizes it for us, that now the church just begins to expand. The, the opposition to the Christians by the Jews kind of subsides. And, and the reason why it subsides is because the persecution against them by the Romans begins to increase. The Romans started to persecute the, the Jews. Caligula will rise to power. He's going to take an image and bring it into the temple. And, and that is going to rile the, the Jews up. And so the, the Jews start battling with the Roman incursion that starts to take place and so the the Christians kind of fall off of the radar uh, Saul is not in the synagogues and uh, and so the church begins to multiply and in verse 32 it tells us now it came to pass as Peter went through all parts of the country so remember that in the early time that the disciples and the apostles, they were staying in Jerusalem and the church kind of departed. Now we see the apostles are moving around and ministering in the different regions and in the different areas. Peter is moving around and he is ministering and, and he comes now throughout all parts of the country and that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. Lydda is... It is close to the coast. It is close to Joppa. It is close to Tel Aviv. It is the town of Lod today. And if you are to go to Israel, you will land at the international airport, Ben Gurion Airport. And Ben Gurion Airport is in Lod, is in Lida, the very place. It is very close to Tel Aviv and to the shores and to Joppa itself. And so Peter is uh, there in uh, Lydda, it tells us. And it says that there he found a certain man named Enos who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. Peter discovers this uh, man, Enos, eight years paralyzed. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine laying in a bed for eight? years not eight months eight years he wasn't born that way something happened to him it doesn't tell us whether or not it was sickness or illness or whether he got run over by a camel or, or whatever happened to him he he, he finds himself now paralyzed eight years and Peter comes and, and it says that, and Peter said to him, Enos, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. And then he arose uh, immediately. Peter identifies who healed him. Jesus the Christ heals you. We see that Peter was only the instrument. And, and we see that Peter relied solely upon the power of Jesus to, to heal this man. And he declares to him, Jesus the Christ heals you. Now arise and make your bed. The very thing that others had had to do for him, he is now capable, he is now able, he is now healed, he is now made a, a whole. And, and we see Enos now arises from that bed and, and he is now healed. And, and we see the healing power of Christ in 
operation and and it speaks uh, volumes not only then but also today as well in verse 35 it says and so all who dwelt at Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord I want you to know that transformed lives uh, glorify God amen and each and every one of us, as our lives are being changed and, and transformed, that transformation of, of your character, of your heart, of your life, of your priorities, the world is watching that and sees that. And there is no argument against that. People can argue with you on theology all day long, but the one thing they cannot argue about is what's happened in your own life. This is who I was and this is who I am and Christ is the one that changed me. When you are stuck in fear and oppression and depression and anxiousness and the Lord heals you and sets you free when you're paralyzed in your life by conflict and, and marital issues and financial crisis and, and the Lord sees you through faithfully and, and you continue to stand up out of that bed that had you paralyzed by the power of Jesus and Christ, the world sees that and takes notice of uh, of it and it says that that many now believed and and i believe that this past year the the lord has done a great work in the church i believe the testimony of the church has has gone throughout i i believe this past year that in many ways we were paralyzed as a community as a as a nation in the world was basically all sent home and and there we were stopped, uh, paralyzed uh, in our lives. Uh, we were afraid of e each other, everybody, every interaction, every person be became a possible threat to our health and not only our health, but possibly even our life. And there was a fear that gripped our nation. All entertainment stopped, all interactions stopped and, and, and our whole lives just we were stuck in a, in a bed. And now the Lord is saying, arise and, and heal and, and go forth. The churches are open. The communities are gathered. And we're worshiping once again. And, and now the, the Lord has done great work. And I, I want you to know that, that while our nation was gripped with fear and while we were at home, Christians and Christians, never lost uh, hope. We still had mm, faith and we still had joy even in the midst of the, the circumstances. And, and, and those that did not have hope and did not have mm, joy, they, they were stuck in an, an entirely different mm, bed than, than we were. He arose and made his bed and started moving forwards uh, once again with his life. And it says that many saw and turned uh, to the Lord. In verse 36, it says that Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. And this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. And, and so Joppa's modern Jaffa. It's a port there in Jerusalem. And, and we meet Tabitha or Dorcas. And, and she was a great saint. She was a beloved saint. She was a, a Proverbs 31 kind of woman. Great reputation. And I think she was a seamstress and she made garments for people. And, and she was constantly doing nice things and charitable things. And and it says in verse 37, but it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Now remember that the custom of the Jews was when somebody died that they buried them before the sun went down. So she dies and they take her to the upper room and they wash her. They, they prepare her to now be wrapped in her grave clothes and perfumed and, and to be buried. But they just keep her there. And they remember that Peter is in the next town uh, over. And, uh, and so it, it says here, and since Lydda was near Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in, in coming to them. And, uh, and so and then Peter arose and went with them. And when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. 
And all the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the tunics and the garments which Dorcas had made while she was uh, with them. As Peter comes from Lydda to Njop, and he, he comes to this house, there is just a wall of grief that he hits. Just the, the mourning and the sorrow of all of the people. She was so beloved, they can't believe that she is gone, that she has died so suddenly and uh, and as Peter comes, they are wailing and weeping and showing him the garments. And, and Peter now continues to, to press uh, through. In verse 40, it says that, but Peter put them all out and he knelt down and prayed. He comes into the room and there is Dorcas, her body is laid out and, and she is dead. He puts everybody out. And he kneels down and he prays. What do you think he prayed? What would you have prayed? There is no doubt he remembers when he was with the Lord. When they were there in Capernaum and Jairus's son, daughter was sick and he was the ruler of the synagogue and he rushes to the Lord and falls down and, and begs that Jesus would come. His 12-year-old daughter is sick. 12 years old. She's at the point of death and he begs that Jesus would come to his household and Jesus agrees to come to the to the household and you'll remember that as they are on the way that's when the woman that had the issue of blood is there and Jesus stops and is ministering to him and and Jairus is trying to to get the the Lord to hurry up and and come to and just uh, and just as Jesus has finished ministering to the lady and begins to head with Jairus the servants from his household and messengers come and tell him your daughter died there's no need for the troubled master any longer. And the Lord hears that and tells him, do not be afraid, just believe. You just hold on to me by faith right now. Don't trust your ears, don't trust your eyes, don't trust anything, just trust me. And they go to the, to the house and the wailing, of the people that are just sobbing over this little girl's death. And, and Jesus, as he comes up to the mourners that are there, asks them, why, why are you weeping? She's not dead, she's just sleeping. And it says, and they scorned him. They ridiculed Jesus. These were the professional mourners that were there now. They know the difference between a sleeping person and a dead person. We're professionals. <laughs> and Jesus puts them all out. But he takes Peter, James, and John in with him. Peter is there with the Lord. And the little girl's body is laid out. And he takes the parents and goes over to the daughter. <coughs> and he says, Talitha Kuman, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. And she sits up. And he resuscitates that little girl. And he instructs them to give her something to eat. And then he tells them, I love this, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's already outside. <laughs> but that was when Jesus was with them, and now Jesus isn't with them. And now Peter is in the room with this woman, Dorcas's body. And he prays. And I, I don't know the prayer, but I, I know what I would have prayed. 
help. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I have no power to bring her back to life. I have zero power. But you have life. And life is in you. And I believe that you have the power to heal her. I believe that. I know that. And now, Lord, help. And so he, he kneels down and he prays. And now it's time for him to, to step out in faith. And it says, in turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. The very words that, that Jesus had used with the little girl in Capernaum. And, and it says, and she opened her eyes and, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. <laughs> she opened her eyes. And then I think they got really wide. <laughs> I'm not sure whose eyes got wider, Peter's uh, or hers. Uh, when, I mean, she wakes up and here's a strange man and what is she doing in this house and why is she laying here and all of the things that there had to have been a disorientation and, and she sits up and, and Peter prays, Tabitha arrives and her eyes open and, and she sits up and there is this glorious uh, moment uh, here. It's important to know that Dorcas wasn't resurrected. She was resuscitated. She was brought back to life from being dead. The, the resurrection is a new life from which there is no death. Jesus is the only one that has resurrected. He's the firstborn of the resurrection. And, and though Dorcas was brought back to life, she will die again. Though Lazarus was brought back to life, he will die again. It is not the resurrection. Our resurrection life is eternal life and we will never die. Jesus is the only resurrected. He is the firstborn of the resurrection. And then he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive and it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed on the Lord. A transformed life glorifies God. And God uses it to bring believers uh, into the family of God. And then in verse 43, it says, And so it was that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon a tanner. It's easy to read over that real quick. Just Simon's staying there. Peter is staying now at, at a home. Simon the tanner who lives in, in Joppa. No big deal. No big deal. And this is why. To the Jews, everything was clean and unclean. Their whole world revolved around clean and unclean. What's clean and what is unclean. What's unclean, you absolutely avoided. And I, I want you to know that a tanner handled the hides of dead animals. That's what he did. He, he, he made leather out of the, uh, the skins of uh, animals. And, and so touching the dead animals made him unclean. And so when he's unclean, his house is unclean. And, and so a tanner's house was always an unclean environment. And Peter is now staying in the house uh, that is not clean. And, and that is going to set the backdrop as God is going to begin to show him now about the old covenant, the clean and the unclean, and now the new covenant of, of grace. And, and so we will see that next time. As we close our study here, I want to draw our attention back to verse 30. Back to when the plot is discovered that they want to kill Saul there in Jerusalem. Not only did they want to kill him when he was in Damascus, but now as, like Peter, he is in the synagogues and preaching. And, and it says that the disciples found out and they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. Tarsus was one of the great cities of the ancient world. It was a university city. It was one of the three great university cities in the, the world. It had a great harbor and strategic placement of trade routes. And Paul would say it's no mean city. It's no small city. It was one of the great cities 
of the world. If you were to mention the great cities of the world today, London and, and Paris and New York, that, that was Tarsus was one of those great, great influential cities. But they weren't sending him to an influential city when they were sending him to Tarsus. They were sending him home. Saul, go home. The rejection that he had to have felt. He had encountered the Lord there in Damascus. He had spent some time in Arabia. He goes back to Jerusalem convinced that now it's time to, to fulfill his commission. The Lord had showed him that he's going to bring the gospel before Gentiles and kings and, and the children of Israel. And, and now that he's had some process time and some preparation time and he comes back to Jerusalem, he is ready to get on with the next season in his life. He is ready to bring the gospel. He's ready to, to change the world. And do you know what they say to him? Go home. Ah. I'm an apostle born out of due time. I, he, he's shown me the things that I'm going to, to suffer. Paul, we've been praying. Go home. And in Acts chapter 22, he, he says that he was praying in the temple. And he was in a trance and he saw the Lord saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. And so I said, Lord, you, you know that in every synagogue I, I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him and and then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And so the Lord meets him there in the, in the temple and tells him to go. Go back home. Sometimes the way forwards in our lives is back. Sometimes before exaltation comes humility. And the way up oftentimes begins by going down. I wonder what that had to have been like returning back home. When he had left, he was the, the joy of Tarsus. He was going and been accepted to sit underneath Gamaliel. He has a meteoric rise. He has a splendid career there in Jerusalem. Becomes a, a powerful influencer. And, and suddenly now he leaves all of that behind. When he accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior, he lost his livelihood, he lost his career, he lost his influence, he lost his fame, he lost his status, he lost his stature, he lost everything. And now he goes home to the, to the house that had supported him going to Jerusalem to sit underneath in Gamaliel. He, he, they paid for his Harvard education and, and he had this brilliant, illustrious career and, and now he's unemployed. You did what? You ruined your entire career by accepting G you're a Christian now? What was that like to go back to his home? So how's your son doing these days? Well, <laughs> he's back home. What's he doing? <laughs> tent making? Probably his father was a tent maker and and had wanted better for his son. And, and he learns tent making from his father later. We'll see it becomes useful. But right now, he, he, he's back home. Sometimes the hardest place that there is to minister and to live out your faith is your own home. 
He spends 10 years there. 10 years. We don't ever see a church founded in Tarsus. The Lord's not using him mightily. And, and those 10 years were years of building character into. So you, you read the things that he suffered and his willingness to suffer, but it was a character that was forged uh, that kept him moving forwards. He wanted to go change the world, but the Lord told him, start in your own home. Go home. Live out your faith right there in your own home. And later we will see that the Lord will send for him and he will become that tremendous apostle, the greatest church planter possibly that the world has ever known, certainly the impact of the spread of the gospel through the apostle Paul. Spectacular. But that boat ride from Caesarea when the apostles tell him to go home, when he has to return and live back in Tarsus for 10 years, those were character building years. And I want to encourage each and every one of us that, that our faith is lived out first in our own home that we might want to be used by the Lord to impact our community and our generation and, and our nation. But, but sometimes it begins by repairing relationships, by ministering to things that had been left behind that need the love of Christ and need a healing hand upon it. It is there within our own homes, our spouses, our children, our family members, our extended family members, where our faith needs to have traction and where we allow the love of God to work through us and in us, to humble ourselves, to apologize, to repair, to forgive, to let go of bitterness, put salve on scars, and to allow the love of Christ to permeate there within our own homes. May the Lord minister to each and every one of us. May, may we truly live our faith out in our homes. And may we trust that the Lord is building in us our character, our lives. He is healing us, making us in the whole. He is healing our homes and moving us and forwards in our life. I want you to know that God never wastes one bit of hardship in your life, one bit of rejection, one wound, one word. He will use uh, all of it to perfect you into the man and to the woman of God that you want to be and that he is building you into. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word today. Lord, whether we have been stuck, paralyzed in a, in a bed and, and we hear the command from you to arise and, and move forwards, Lord, how empowering that is. And, and Lord, or whether we are like Dorcas and, and there are parts of our hearts, parts of our lives that have died and that you are bringing back to life again, Lord, we, we thank you for, for hearing you say to us, arise and and move forwards uh, now. And, and Lord, sometimes moving forwards can feel like we're being directed backwards. But God, uh, with you, uh, all things are possible. And so we trust you wholly, completely to listen to your voice. Bless us now and help us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.